Uh, the further I go along in this series, the more I'm realizing I'm being too uh, thorough. And so I'm going to have to be a lot more cursory in the future. Because uh, when I sat down to do these slides, I ended up exhausting 1 Corinthians and I had no more time left to do anything else. So. Okay, if, if that's what you want, this is what I can do. So uh, I, I, we're not going to go through all of Paul's life and letters, but we're, we're going we're gonna to do this. All right, 1 Corinthians was written from Ephesus in around 53 to 55 AD. And uh, this is written during the third missionary journey, journey. So we are not finished with the third missionary journey. This is in Ephesus, and he's hearing, he receives a letter uh, from, I think it's Chloe, uh, in Corinth, and she's complaining, she says, we got some problems here, you need to help us out. Um, <clears throat> and here's the outline of it, this is essentially uh, <laughs> problems in the church. Uh, the church always has problems, and I think if you look at this, I think this is the kind of problems that almost every church has. Not to the same degree, but somewhat similar. I, I remember thinking, boy, these problems are so bad. Is this even a church? We'll, we'll even get to that. Uh, there's contention in the church. Wow, big surprise. Of course there is. We're sinners. There's fornication that happens. Yeah, that happens. Uh, litigation. I don't see this one as much. Uh, the Lord has spared me from, or at least that I know. Maybe these things secretly happen and I just don't know about them. <clears throat> the Lord has spared me from my time in churches from any outright litigation. And that has been a blessing. But not for them. And I know it happens in other churches. Uh, one, one of the things that we, I guess we can see it in this church, because we do have precautions that we take uh, to comply with the state and comply with our insurance about being safe, uh, to keep ourselves safe from lawsuits. So in that sense, it, it's something that's always of concern to us. <clears throat> Marriage problems, Meats offered to idols, and you might think, well, we don't have any meats offered to idols. But the whole subject matter that's being dealt with there and how you practice your, your freedom in Christ. Uh, you're free to do lots of things, but if you know that it is a burden to somebody else's conscience, you're also free not to do it. You don't have to do it if it's going to cause your brother to sin and scandalize them. So just because you're free in Christ doesn't mean you scandalize your brother and do things that, that, that upset them on purpose or you don't care about upsetting people. Something you should always consider. Uh, public worship, always something of import to the church. People are always concerned about it. People's gifts, and they want to use their gifts and they abuse their gifts. They want to make a show of their gifts in front of everybody. And so they say, well, I just have to do this. And if I can't do this at this church, I'll go to another one. <clears throat> or deciding which gifts are the most important. What's more important than this? What is of less importance? <clears throat> we, we all have to make these decisions when we use the people in the church. And people get offended because uh, they believe that their gift is not being used. And the mystery of the resurrection. This also is something always of importance to the church because it is the substance of not just our faith and our love, but our hope. In order to be a Christian, you have to hope in the future. If you believe that there is no resurrection, then what's the point? What's the point of serving God if you don't exist? Uh, so th this is very important, and Paul has to reassure the Corinthians of their hope of the future. And material assistance for the needy. We have a diaconate. 
The diaconate is concerned with the bodily welfare of our church. Our church is concerned with our bodies as well as our souls. <clears throat> so though we may see the particulars and think, boy, they've got these strange problems in the first century. We don't want to have people doing that. Well, in, to a lesser extent, or sometimes a greater, we do. Uh, first, let me read this little part of 1 Corinthians, where he says, Paul called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Notice what he says about Corinth, the church there. He says it's a church and that they're called by God. <clears throat> when you read these problems that the church in Corinth has, you think, this doesn't sound like a disciplined church. This sounds like a zoo. This is insanity. How can they even call themselves a church? I remember thinking about this when I read uh, 1 Corinthians in the past and thinking, man, they're so messed up. How do they get this wrong? They're still a church. Paul is calling them to repentance. He's not done. God isn't done with these people yet. <clears throat> and so we come to the first part of 1 Corinthians, which is uh, the contention, the contentious nature that they have. And we still have this spirit today. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people, that's that letter from Corinth, he's at Ephesus, Chloe says, we've got a problem and we need your help. <clears throat> that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul. I follow Apollos, I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Um, there is a party spirit in the church, and it can happen in so many different ways. Uh, there's this phenomenon, I think I've told you about this before, but I think it bears repeating, in churches that have had a lead pastor for around 20 or 30 years. This is something that happens, it's a real thing doesn't happen every time, but it happens. That pastor retires, and then the people in the church have one set thing in their mind about how a pastor should be, and it's not exactly 1 Timothy or Titus, it's Pastor Bob and what he did for those 30 years. That's the only thing that's acceptable. And so they, they hire this other guy, and they have this somehow idea that pastor, new Pastor Jim is going to be exactly like Pastor Bob. And, and they get really disappointed when it doesn't work out that way, and then he's gone within two years. That's it. And then they start looking for a pastor again, and they start to realize... No, this guy's not going to be like Pastor Bob. We, we had unrealistic expectations, and so they reel them back in, and then they settle on the next guy. And th this is a real thing that happens. And so you, you need to make sure <clears throat> uh, you, you love this pastor. He's been here for, for 20, 30 years. Uh, don't become of a party spirit that says this kind of guy is the only kind of guy that is acceptable. And anybody else uh, has to fit in his mold. We have to go back to Scripture and see what it says in 1 Timothy and in Titus about what the man of God is and not force somebody into our made-up thinking of what a pastor is. Go back to Scripture all the time to evaluate your standards of what a pastor is. Um, 
He doesn't have to be that way that you think he has to be. He has to be what Scripture says he has to be. And so people do this in other ways as well in the church. They, I am of Douglas Wilson. I am of Covenant Seminary. I'm of Westminster Seminary. I'm of Greenville Seminary. And they have this artificial standard that they place and they use to evaluate everyone that comes within their purview. Uh, If you're from that seminary, bad. If you're from that seminary, you're good. You're okay. And you have the superficial lens that you look at reality through. Uh, You have to be willing to admit that any human being and any human document can err, can make a mistake. But it's the scriptures that are always correct. And here's here's this other interesting thing here. Look at this. I follow Christ. That too is of a party spirit. How can this be? Aren't aren't you supposed to be of Christ? Yes, you are. But there's a bad way you can be of Christ. What's a bad way that you can be of Christ when it's not really Christ? What I do is is being Christian. Yeah, what I do. So you are projecting yourself onto what you think Christ is. All of these thoughts in my head about Jesus, that has to be true. Instead of evaluating who you think Jesus Christ, my Christ wouldn't do that. My Jesus wouldn't do that. No. The Christ of scriptures, the scriptures, the only infallible rule of our faith. So the scriptures have to reign supreme. That has to be the thing that we're united around. And that doesn't mean you don't, because other, in other places, uh, <clears throat> Paul's a good guy. Apollos is a good guy. Cephas is a good guy, and Christ is the guy. But they're all one, if you view them correctly. Paul is able to correct Peter, and he appeals back to the Bible. And Peter points back to the epistles of Paul and says, that's scripture. So they both acknowledge each other. So you can't pit them against each other. You can't pick your guy. It has to be the scriptures as your standard. Is Christ divided? No. Was Paul crucified for you? No. Or were you baptized in the... No. I thank God that I baptized none of you. (laughs) Except Crispus and Gaius. So that no one may say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the household of Stephanas. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. So he's saying that all these guys should be viewed together. And I'm glad, and notice the the place of prominence he gives to this particular part here. The preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ is the primary way by which the church saves sinners. So look look at the architecture here. The architecture says it. You guys see it? Got the table down here. And what's up here? The pulpit, and on the pulpit is the Word of God. Our, even our architecture in our building declares this truth. Um, the, the Roman Catholic Church put so much emphasis on the Lord's Supper such that it was effectual without faith. It was effectual without preaching. It was effectual without the truth. But Martin Luther and the Reformers turned that upside down and said, no, it is the word of God that gives meaning to the sacraments and meaning to the other things we do in the church. So we focus on the word, and we we prefer 
not to just give somebody the Lord's Supper without the Word of God being read or taught or without the, the, the Lord's Supper being uh, guarded and fenced and interpreted because it is only through faith that these things are effectual for our salvation. So the Word of God must be primary. And he said, not with words of eloquent wisdom. <clears throat> There's this other emphasis in the Puritans and the Reformers for the plain style of preaching and not this overly gilded uh, thing like uh, you would get with John Donne. Not that John Donne gives bad sermons, okay? You'd probably find some good sermons in John Donne, but the style was so eloquent and exalted that it made it hard for common people to understand, and that was a problem. And so what, what the Puritans tried to do was take the rhetoric down a level to make sure that the understanding that we don't go... When preaching happens, it doesn't primarily go through your emotions first. It goes through the intellect and the knowledge of man. And from that intellect and knowledge, their hearts are warmed with the truth. And, it, and then it goes to the will such that we make choices to live in accord with the truth. So this, this is this plain style of preaching. Uh, lest the cross be emptied of its power. If you don't know what the person is talking about, and you just have these feels, and then you go away, you've got nothing after the feeling is gone. You want something substantive that stays. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And this is talking about the preaching again. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? So this foolishness of eloquence is, is also connected with the foolishness of this world. And what is the foolishness of the world? I think if you go back to Proverbs, you figure it out. If you go back to that parable that Jesus tells of the rich man who builds his barns, remember that one? Where he says, I'm going to build my barns bigger, I'm going to build my uh, storage places bigger, and I'm going to say to myself, self, you've made it. There is nothing else necessary in this world that you need, essentially. And the Bible says, Jesus says, thou fool, today, this day, um, your life is required of you. And it's when we only think about and live for the things of this world, we're foolish because we only live here for about 120 years. But when we die, we will have an eternity of either happiness or suffering. So which is wiser? To build up gold that lasts for 120 years and then we can't enjoy it anymore to get that? Or to get the gold that lasts for eternity? This is the kind of wisdom that this world offers. They know they can get you rich here. They can get you pleasure here. They can get you power here, but it comes with an awful price. And this is how Satan works. He'll give you something, but in the end, it will destroy you and debase you and hurt everyone around you that you love. He can offer you things, but in the end, they are not the things that you want or need. The wisdom of the cross is the one that doesn't look here, but his vision goes off into eternity and looks forward to the new heavens and the new earth where righteousness dwells. That's the true wisdom of the cross. While I suffer here now, I suffer with Christ, just as Christ suffered in his life here on this earth. 
but with him as he is resurrected from the dead, so too my body will be raised from the dead to enjoy the mansions prepared for me in glory, riches. I hath not seen nor ear hath heard what God has prepared for his children, pleasures at his right hand forevermore. What's that compared to the pleasures focused here? <clears throat> so this is the wisdom of the cross, the wisdom that destroys the wisdom of, this, of the wise and the discerning the sermon of the discerning, these people who discern things merely here on this earth, and it makes them nothing. Folly to those who are perishing. All they see is this world. The Roman religion was based in the military, as Rome was based on military conquest. When they wanted something, they saw another nation, and they went and they took it, and they made them slaves. And they would worship gods based on who would give them military conquest. So when they looked at Jesus, who died on the cross, he said, they said, why would we worship him? He, he's a loser. He lost. He died. We want a God who wins. And so they only think about this world. They only think about here and now. They're not thinking about the future. And God has made uh, the, the foolish the wisdom of this world by his death on the cross and his ascension. For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, the world did not know God through their kind of wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach. It's not really folly. It's only folly to them. To save those who believe. For Jews demand signs, and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews, and folly to the Gentiles. They have this, only this worldly perspective. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. It's not saying that he's really weak. But I, I give you an analogy of what this is saying. Uh, if you had 100 MMA fighters against God and God were to hogtie himself, he would still win. Uh, he, he doesn't need the things that we need. He needs nothing. He, he, everything about God is smarter, is wiser, is greater than men. So even if God were to act foolish if that were possible. Uh, Russ Limbaugh would say he could still win if he tied half his brain behind his back. Uh, <laughs> I mean, that's God. Uh, his wisdom, his, even his foolishness, is wiser than the wisdom of men. Even his weakness is stronger than men. <clears throat> yes? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, this, this happens e even now because we have, we have peace with conscience now. Even though we suffer in the body, even though we don't have things like those in power have, we have peace with con uh, conscience. They don't have that. They are tormented by their own wealth. They are tormented by their own pleasures. This is the way Satan works. He goes to Adam and Eve and he says, oh, you'll get everything you want. You see though, that tree? You see it's good? It, it'll make you wise like God. And then they get it. And they're not happy. Um, yeah. Just look at their lives. These are not, they may present happiness but the, a lot of their lives are a complete wreck to the extent that they do not follow uh, God's law and his word. <clears throat> and then we bring, that brings us to fornication. 
it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not tolerated even among the pagans. For a man has his father's wife, and you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. There's a modern day analogy to this. I'll just go ahead. Mm. Let's say you have somebody who says, the church needs to be nice. The church needs to be winsome. Therefore, you're not allowed to upset people by telling them the truth. Therefore, we're going to keep this truth in scriptures away from God's people, and we're going to refuse to preach on it. And so what happens? Instead of confronting sin, the church is silent. So you know what happens? When you, out of a desire for peace, you never confront somebody, they keep doing it. And it gets worse. It doesn't get better. If you don't go up to somebody and gently try to tell them to stop or to repent, and if you don't take the risk of hurting their feelings, even though you try not to, If you don't take the risk, it's going to keep happening, and people are going to keep doing it. If you don't preach on it because you're afraid of upsetting people's feelings, maybe that'll save you a couple of emails. But in the long term, it doesn't work. And we always have this dynamic in our own families, don't we? We have to balance... Peace. What are these people ready to hear from me? What is my husband? What is my wife ready to hear from me? I know I could start this argument by pointing out this fault. If I, if I want to, I can do it. And so we have to make this balancing act between deciding how much to confront and how much to wait to address or to address in a different way. So I'm not saying that this is easy. I'm not saying just go all out. Say everything. Uh, But the pendulum has has shifted too far in one direction. Where modern day evangelicals talk about believe, 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 but they never say repent, repent, repent. Uh, There are two sides of the same coin. In order to turn to the Lord Jesus Christ, you must turn away from your sin. And when you evangelize, you're going to be tempted. As I feel this temptation when we go to uh, Boardwalk Chapel, that it would be just easier to talk about, believe in Lord Jesus Christ. He has a wonderful plan for your life. And never talk to them about their sin. Because then you get uncomfortable and they get uncomfortable. But you got to do it. They got to know there's something. They need to turn, they have a problem. If you're the doctor, you have to convince your patient that there's actually something wrong that needs addressing. If you don't convince them, then they're going to have big problems. And so, you got to put your foot down. Instead of saying, look, we have this guy who's married uh, his father's wife. We are so accepting. We are so kind. Look at us. And they're arrogant, it says. They're bragging in this. He says, ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. That's the hard act of discipline. We can't just be all candy and sweets all day long. Candy and sweets are great. Passing over sins is great. But you have to be ready for discipline, and here's why. These people will congratulate themselves and pat themselves on the back and say how loving and how kind and gracious they are. But it's not. For though absent and in my body, I am present in spirit, 
And as of present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. It is Paul's and the Holy Spirit's will that these kind of people who are living in this kind of sin and unwilling to repent, that Satan destroy their bodies, that they be hurt and punished. What is the reason? So that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. So which is more loving? Which is what this person needs? Does he need to be coddled? Does it need to be told, oh, it's okay, it doesn't matter. His spirit needs to be saved. He needs to be disciplined. He needs to be cast out of the church so that his spirit can be saved. This is the end of church discipline. And do you know what we find in 2 Corinthians? I'll go ahead and I'll spoil it. He repents. And Paul has to write 2 Corinthians to say, bring them back into the church. Don't keep them out. He repented. They repented. Bring them back in. And this is why this church discipline exists. It exists for the purity of the church and the witness of the church. And it exists so that it saves the souls of those who are disciplined. And then this brings us to the litigation that is happening in the church. When one of you has a grievance against another, does he dare go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases Do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more than matters pertaining to this life? So if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? We need to handle our church discipline cases in-house as much as we can so that we can uh, give a proper witness to the world. If we air all our dirty laundry out to all those people out there, uh, we are not doing the church a favor. It's it's just like the same with marriage. Uh, That woman and that man who goes out complaining about their spouse uh, every chance that they can get is not doing their church, their marriage, a service. They are hurting their marriage. These things need to be handled as much as possible. Of course, there are circumstances where uh, things cannot be resolved, and then you have to take it up uh, with the elders. But as much as possible, we respect our wives, and we respect our husbands, and we try our best not to complain about them to other people. If we really have a problem, we need to go talk about it with them. And if it's something that can't be solved, we have to show grace, at least in some... uh, I'm not talking about any physical harm or anything like that that the police are going to have to be involved if, if people are being abused, if real abuse is taking place. I'm not talking about that. Uh, but other things, you need to show respect to your husband and to your wife uh, by either passing over it or talking about it with them. And that in itself takes wisdom because there, there are things that you should really pass over. Uh, sometimes we are far too sensitive when our pride comes into it and we get offended by things that we should not be offended by and we're very crass and we don't care how other people feel when we do things as well. So this is one of the reasons why uh, Pastor David tells us we need to have thick skin as Christians. We, need not, we shouldn't be responding in anger to every criticism that our wife gives. We should not respond with with, uh, tears and running to our room every time our husband sits down with us to talk about something he's concerned about. Both of these responses are are not good. We have to use wisdom. We have to try to handle things in-house until we cannot. 
I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute between the brothers? But brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers. To have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. And here's what I said. Why not rather suffer wrong? As Christians, you must be willing to suffer some wrong from other people, just as other people suffer wrong from you. How peaceful would a church be if all they ever talked about was what other people did wrong? How peaceful would your marriage be if the only thing that you talk about with each other is what the other person is doing wrong? you got to let some things slide. I mean, I, I couldn't teach uh, middle schoolers and high schoolers, if, if I talked about everything that was going wrong all the time, I would never teach my subject. <laughs> if every time they disrespected me, I, I, I threw my book across the room and stormed out and went to George and said, I will not teach these children. They are disrespecting me. Well, I'd get fired. <laughs> Straight up. Because i got to be able to handle it i got to put a lid on it and be willing to suffer some things. Um, and this takes wisdom to decide what, what, what's high priority, what can't be passed over, and what can be passed over. And I can't decide that for you. You, you, you need to figure that out. And that's why we pray for wisdom. It's not enough to just know what the Bible says and understand what it says. Uh, Solomon prays for wisdom. How am I going to apply this law to these people? <laughs> God, help me. Uh, and, and that's what all of your life requires. Marriage problems. And we get to the section on correction. Now, concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. But because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife, and each woman her own husband. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights, and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another, except perhaps by agreement, perhaps, (laughs) by agreement for a limited time that you may devote yourselves to prayer but then come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Okay, It's good to be married, and in some instances it's good to be not married. I think you can see that from up here. Now concerning the matters, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. And in other places in Corinthians it talks about he's going to give her in marriage or he's not going to give her in marriage. And he says concerning the present distress it's probably not a good idea to get married. And I think what he's talking about in 1 and 2 Corinthians is a specific time that's happening then to them where (laughs) there is great persecution. And you connect that with, uh, I think it's the Gospel of Luke, where Jesus is saying, uh, woe to those who are with child. Because it's going to be harder. And and if if you're married right now, and it's going to be hard for you to take your family up and move somewhere else if you're going to be persecuted. So there are some pluses and minuses uh, to being married, but one of the things you need to think about, because of temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. So if you are tempted to sexual immorality, that is a sign for you. You do not have this gift of uh, singleness. And so we're supposed to get married. Try to get married. Look for that opportunity. Now when it says this, one part of the word, don't forget every other part of the word as well. There are other rules that have to do with marriage. So you don't just marry anybody. Um, That's going to cause problems and God has laws against that. You only marry in the Lord. And likewise, I want you to see here 
that God wants you in marriage to have sex. He made it. It is good if it is used correctly. And Satan wants to destroy this good gift. Uh, he, you can see from the culture that he, he wants to destroy men and make, turn them into something that's not a man. And he wants to destroy women and turn them into to destroy their own body parts and, and make them some sort of neutral thing. And this is an abomination. Uh, God has made us to be fruitful and multiply and use the gift of our sexuality um, to unite the marriage relationship. It is, sex isn't everything. It's a gift, but it's a good thing. It's a good thing. It's not an idol, but it's a good thing and is to be used in accordance with God's word. And this is what it says here. And so um, we are to be deferring for the good of our partner to grant them those things that are in accord with God's word and to the extent, and remembering all the other rules of God's word, uh, if sex, is a, a sex can be anybody's idol, even if you're married or if you're not, it can still be an idol. Uh, it can happen too much, it can happen too little. Again, it takes wisdom. And I can't tell you, I can't give you three simple rules because the Bible is so complicated about it, okay? It's going to take wisdom for you to apply the word in your marriage relationship and do it correctly. We're not supposed to use it as a weapon to withhold because we're angry. And we're not going to use it as a weapon against them. If, uh, if our wife is not feeling good, then take the hint, okay? If you're not feeling good, you, you're not wanting to do it either. So use your own judgment. Use your own wisdom. And these things are supposed to be done within the marital relationship. And that marriage exists. One of the reasons it exists is to deal with those sexual urges and push them in a productive direction to produce a godly seed. And we learn about in other places in Corinthians that there's something mystical happening in the act of sex. Um, Paul talks about don't unite the body of Christ with, with a body of a, a prostitute. Because that's what's happening when, when you take a prostitute or take someone who's not your, your wife. You are degrading yourself. There, there is something spiritual that happens in the marital relationship. It's not merely some physical thing. We're not merely animals. We are made in God's image and there's something spiritual that happens between the husband and the wife uh, when, when they do these things in accordance with God's word and to his glory. <clears throat> Self-control. Always something that's necessary for the Christian to have balance. To, to know what is most important and what is less important. Um, so it, it's important to remember not to place too high a priority in sex, but don't, don't put it as nothing. Now we come to meats. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence. And that there is no God but one, for although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and for whom we exist in one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. However, not all possess this knowledge, but some through the former association with idols. They were idol worshipers. And they worshipped these false gods, these demons. And their conscience being weak is defiled. They associate all of that stuff with their former way of life. And if you eat this food sacrificed to idols, even though it's nothing, 
and they know it was sacrificed to an idol, their conscience is going to be hurt and they're going to be tempted to sin. Food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat and no better off if we do. But take care that this right, it's your right to do this, of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged if his conscience is weak to eat food offered to idols? And so by your knowledge this weak person is destroyed, the brother for whom Christ died. Thus sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest my brother stumble. Now, what he doesn't know won't hurt him. And it says this in other places where it says, don't inquire if the food was sacrificed to idols. It says, Paul says, you can eat that. But if the person knows, and they they see you there, and they're tempted to sin, you have used your liberty incorrectly. <clears throat> so, so what does this mean? Does this mean that we are in constant captivity to all the strange beliefs and thoughts of other people in the church? Uh, like <laughs> this person might come in with a tinfoil hat and say, you can't have the Holy Spirit unless you wear this tinfoil hat and you get the Holy Spirit rays beamed into you. Are we held captive by this person's silly belief? Well, this person needs instruction very badly. And they need to be able to receive instruction. They can't be recalcitrant in their belief. They need to be willing to receive instruction. So it's not only on one side here. Uh, you, can, you can accede to their requests for the time being, but this other person needs to commit to being instructed by God about what the Bible really says. So this is a two-way street here. We're not, we're, we have not become slaves to the whims of other people in our church, but at the same time, uh, we're not to take advantage of the younger Christians say, who cares, I'm going to do what I want. It's better to be wronged. It's better to be wronged to hurt our, than to hurt our brothers in Christ. But it doesn't mean we don't instruct them either. So they're, they're going to need some extra instruction. Yes? Yes. Because he gives instruction other, other ways that he who partakes of the worship, the pagan worship, partakes of the idol. So something spiritual is happening. But if it's just something that's sacrificed to idols and and you just pick it up and you eat it, in other places it talks about, you know, that's fine. But don't inquire. And again, this is something that takes wisdom. Um, The weak brother needs to be instructed, and if they refuse instruction, that's bad. They need to repent. If somebody has liberty and they're just flaunting it and say, I don't care what anybody thinks, that's not loving. So both groups are in the wrong. Both need, yes. So I think where you might see this is Jesus eating and sinners' houses. Yeah. Jesus eating and sinners' houses. Because sinners are tempted to eat food that is sacrificed to Yeah.
Absolutely. This is not an easy teaching. Even as I stand up here explaining to it and as I've read, uh, wisdom is required in this. <clears throat> but in the following instructions, now turning to meetings, I do not commend you because when you come together, it is not for the better but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. So going back to what he said at the first, and I believe it in part, for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. You get this question a lot. Why do bad things happen to God's people? For there must be factions among you, bad thing, in order that there's a purpose. Those who are genuine among you may be recognized. You're always going to deal with heresy and bad teaching in the church. And it's for this purpose. God is testing his people. God is sifting his people to see who is real and to see who is not real. And those who are not real will depart into heresy and they will seek gods who call themselves Jesus who are not really Jesus. And this is the way that we live in a sin-cursed world and God has not come back and the resurrection of the dead has not happened yet. So we wait and we have to deal with these things. We will never find the perfect church. You will never be in a perfect church it, until Christ returns. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one of you goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. <clears throat> so they were <laughs> taking food from home, having a feast in front of people who are poor, and not offering them any food. Uh, part of the symbolism of the Lord's Supper is that we partake together. And when they partake in this way, they're not showing the unity of the body of Christ and their love for one another. They are proclaiming their disunity and their factiousness and their thoughts, I'm better than you. You don't get any of this with me. You're over there. Stay over there. And so we have a responsibility in the church to take care of one another. And it's reflected in this instruction right here. And this is a way that we're proclaiming Christ until he comes. Oh, I'm not going to make it. Love never ends. This is changing to the different gifts that God gives his church. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. I used to always interpret this as the resurrection and Christ coming back. But the more and more that I read this, I see it's ambiguous. The word perfect means complete. And so I read other places, uh, other men who said that this refers to Scripture. I'm getting more and more to the point where I think that this is the case. Because I, I, I'm not sure, it doesn't seem certain to me, that this is referring to the resurrection. So these gifts that God has given His church have been as they always were, meant to be signs to point to the prophet, to authenticate his prophecy, so that it would be brought into the canon. And this same thing, I think, is happening here. That these different sign gifts, these fancy gifts, are here until the full canon is, is, is brought into the church. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, as even I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. When the perfection of the Scripture comes into place, 
This is the body of doctrine that is infallible. I don't need another word from God. I have it. I have everything I need to live the Christian life. All the truth that I need is in the pages of this book. So now faith, hope, and love abide. Those things are going to abide in the Christian church. All those other things, not so much. Faith, hope, and love are going to abide. But the greatest of these is love. <clears throat> and there's the whole chapter of love, which is most important. I didn't include it here because you guys receive so much instruction. At least I have uh, in the church where 1 Corinthians 13 is such a popular chapter. I decided to omit it. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't have, but I did. <clears throat> love never ends. I already did that. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. And this resurrection proclaims Jesus Christ as having the kingdom. Um, we have this kingdom being given to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now remember... God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost are all in their essence ruling from all time and all history. But something different happens when the Son takes on a human nature, dies and is resurrected from the dead. Right now, we have a human nature who has been given authority over the church. Jesus Christ, in His human nature, the Messiah King is enthroned over all principalities and power. And he's going to have this kingdom up until the resurrection and the judgment. And then Christ in his human nature, not in his divine nature, takes that kingdom and says, here's what I've done with it, Father, and I give it to you. So there's that distinction between the divine nature of Christ and human nature of Christ. There's a sense in which this Jesus did not have the kingdom, but then he does, and then he gives it back to God the Father. In his divinity, Jesus Christ has always reigned, but in his humanity, he has this authority given to him, and he gives that authority back at the end. And he reigns until all his enemies are under his feet, the last enemy to be destroyed, is death. Jesus Christ, in his human nature, is enthroned as King of kings and Lord of lords. And this was proclaimed by his human bodily resurrection. God rewarded him with a messianic kingdom over the church and over every kingdom that exists, whether it's Iran or Afghanistan or the United States. Jesus Christ is king and king especially over his church. <clears throat> and this is what we're about. We're about destroying the enemies, not by physical weapons of warfare, but by spiritual weapons and the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm already past time. Any questions or comments? That's true. Either a man or a woman. That's true. These, these are all different kinds of dynamics that happen in, in families, yes. All right, let's pray.